friendship isn't about who you've known the longest. It's about who came and never left your side. Hey, I want to welcome everyone to another exciting episode of Tap Talks. And tonight we're going to be hearing some different views from six friends. And some of these questions were pretty tough, some really interesting, interesting perspectives. And uh, hopefully the next time you have a family gathering and you want to find something extremely interesting to kind of uh, break the ice and thought provoking, you may want to use some of these questions. Hey, everyone this is dr michelle and i want to welcome you to another exciting episode of tab talks and tonight we have six friends answering six tough questions so we've got sandy hey sandy hi <laughs> we got marcy hello hey it's like like hollywood squares so we have sergey <laughs> how are you hey we got mark good afternoon Oh, we have, we want to thank Curtis. And now Mark's got the football field, so he, he looks like he, he's in a fun cool. place, so we'll see. Okay. <laughs> I guess, you know, I always like to start an icebreaker. This is really fun, but I've been having people do this whenever I'm on a virtual. I always say if everybody can point at me, because I think it's kind of funny, if everybody would just point to me and then we see. <laughs> hey. Okay, that's pretty Where'd funny. Yeah, that's okay, the visual. See, I can point at me. <laughs> <laughs> My finger looks pretty out of out of size. Oh, did you do your nails? Yeah, <laughs> that was a setup. If your nails aren't done, okay. We got some tough questions, and I'm not gonna uh, softball you guys. So uh, we're gonna oh, get boy. started. Okay, what would you do if fear was not a factor? and you knew you could not fail. So who wants to start? I'll just light up the board. <laughs> Sandy, you want to start? I'll start. I really did think a lot about this. Um, there are a lot of things that I could have said, but something that I used to do, I used to lead, lead praise when Jim was pastoring, but I was always scared to death. And so I would like to be able to sing without fear, with passion, and with anointing, truly. want to sing. Okay, we're going to put you on star search. That kind of no. thing? No, 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 just, no, no. <laughs> just sing at church? Sing. Well, you have, you have to get back in church before you can do that, because I haven't found one yet. <laughs> okay. Hey, Mark, what would... What would you say to that? Oh, that's a tough one. Uh, Hard. <laughs> I guess I would say that I would probably maybe go scuba diving. Uh, I love the ocean. It's probably my, to be on the ocean and the beach is like my favorite place in the world, but actually getting into the ocean, I'm terrified. There's a bunch of things in there that can eat you and sting you and kill you. So I guess <laughs> if I could, I would probably go like uh, deep sea diving and go underwater and, you know, view like old shipwrecks and things of that nature. If I knew I wouldn't die. If you knew you wouldn't die. Okay. No, it's not going to fail. <laughs> okay, Marcy. Actually, um, there's a business idea that I believe God has placed into my heart that I'm actually working through details of. And honestly, if I had no fear and no anything, which actually I'm probably at that point right now, <laughs> I um, would get in a position where I'd leave everything and go all the way in on this business idea. So. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. I, I agree. I agree with that. I I also was thinking about yeah. I would start a business definitely. Because if you if one wants to make an impact impact in life, I mean, starting the good business would be would be it. Although on the other hand, as I was thinking about this, I was thinking I would just do drugs, a lot of drugs. <laughs> just think about this. Whatever the hidden desires I have, <laughs> even I don't know I have them, they could all come true. Boss, boss is this. I mean, <laughs> so all, all those desires can come true. <laughs> and then if you knew you wouldn't, uh, yeah. 
we can there be a consequence? Right. A well, it says if the bat fails, so, so I can't <laughs> assume no, no consequences. <laughs> <laughs> At first, I didn't understand what Sergey was talking about when he said he would take drugs if there weren't consequences. But, you know, when they're drugs to make you happy, drugs to make you sad, uh, drugs to make you wake up, drugs to make you go to sleep, they're consequences. And so I clearly understand what he's talking about when he says, I'd like to do all those things, too, if there wasn't a consequence. When you take into account that about 66 percent of the adult population in the U.S. is on some type of prescription drug. And then when you look at the average prescription drug label and they list at least 70 side effects, it's no wonder that when you see numbers like 700,000 people going into an ER each year because of prescription side effects, that Sergey says it's just not worth the risk. Okay, well, I said... I'd like to take a cruise on one of those ice boats and go see the glaciers, but I'd be scared that we get stuck. <laughs> I've oh, always man. wanted to go see those glaciers. You know how you can get like right up on the edge of the ship as it's yeah. cutting through the ice? Yep. I would love to do that, but I, there's something kind of scary about that to me. It yeah. is yeah. scary. I, I've been on glaciers in Iceland. Yes. And it is scary. Okay, so see, you validated my fear. See, there, yep. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> there you go. Okay, uh -huh. Curtis, what would you say? I would like to climb Mount Everest. Uh, I remember as a kid watching like National Geographic shows. It's something that I always wanted to do. And it's on my bucket list, so I'm still going to try to do it. Climb Mount Everest. There are studies which confirm that humans can smell fear in the sweat of other humans. Hey, Kurt had to leave us and then there were five. Thanks, Kurt, for stopping in. We appreciate it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, we're going to get on one of those subjects. They always tell you not to talk about religion in a group, but we're going to talk about religion. Okay. Do you believe the United States of America practices freedom of religion. Whoever wants to start, just jump in. Yeah, certainly. Certainly. To the extent that it's uh, practical. I mean, you can start a church on the corner and I mean, you're going to have a congregation and whatnot. So I, I think it's, yeah, definitely. Okay. I would say yes and no. Um, I believe that for the most part, yes, and ideally they want to, but there are some different practices of different religions that are not acceptable in the United States. Like for instance, if you are a part of a religion that practices polygamy or polygamy, then it's still illegal to marry multiple spouses here in the United States. So that's not truly uh, freedom of re practicing religion to its capacity. Um, also, there may be some other, that's just one of many other practices of different religions that are just not acceptable in our culture. Uh, so while we idealistically, yes, we accept your, your ideas of it on it, we accept that you practice certain things, to an extent, we're going to say uh, the, the government is going to not allow certain practices. So, yeah, yes and no. We yes, if you believe that way, okay, cool. However, you can't do X, Y, Z, so you can't fully commit to that. Here. Interesting. What'd you say, Mark? Uh, I kind of agree with her. I think if you practice the right religion, then yes, I think there are certain uh, religions. Mainly, especially Islam and Muslims, is I think they get extremely bad rap here in the states. Um, I think if you flew a, a Muslim flag in your yard, you'd probably get your house vandalized. Um, you know, here in America, Muslim is synonymous with terrorist. Um, so I think we do have religious freedoms, but if you if you belong to the right religion. Now I'm going to say when it, I agree with you, right? Yeah. Um, but I think that's more of the cultural acceptance of it, more so than the U.S. government acceptance of it. That I think the U.S. government will accept Muslims, but us as people have a harder time accepting it. And that's, we're having a hard time as a culture accepting um, 
that as their norm and respecting one another. We have a long way to go as a society to respect one another's freedom of anything, the freedom to think, speak any way that they want to. So um, yeah, that's, which is really sad, but um, I think that's more so of a cultural thing than a governmental thing. Hey, Sandy, you want to chat on that one? Yeah, I, I agree. I, I do feel that the government can interfere like, um, and, and I can't back this up with anything because I really did look it up, but like, I, I believe that we do need to respect and we need to honor people's beliefs. Uh, the thing that I think gets us in trouble is when extremism comes into play. Like not all Muslims are extremists. We had some that attacked the United States on, you know, yeah. September 11th. But that does not speak to the major race or the major religion of Islam. So it's extremists. It's uh, in any religion, I think extremism is in trouble. And like Sharia law, I think I don't think that's permitted by law here in the United States. Is it, Michelle? Do you know um, Sharia law? Because I know that that that's you know that that is some of what is practiced, but I don't believe that that is the government. I believe would intervene and not allow that. I think there would be consequences if someone was to implement that. Yes, yeah, if, if the law, if the Sharia law doesn't butt up against uh, our laws, like essentially, our, if you can right. kill someone who can convert, if they want to convert from Muslim to Christianity, you can like legally behead them in Sharia law. I do believe. That doesn't right. fly here in the yeah, United States. Right. It actually happened, and they were found guilty, even though they right. they with their own religion. Yeah, yeah. I, believe, I believe there was a man um, that committed murder, and I don't think his daughter wanted to convert, but she didn't want to follow the precepts that he had set, and he he killed her. And I believe I believe he went to prison. I believe he went to prison. So um, extremism and anything is. Pretty dangerous, but yeah, I think we're doing better. Here we see protesters in Washington, D.C. protesting Sharia law, as well as billboards that have been erected. So we don't tolerate religious practices when they don't align with our system of laws. I you think know, it's interesting because I looked up some stats just to see, you know, in terms of the United States of America, seven out of ten people in this country practice Christianity. So it maybe the tolerance or intolerance is more because it's so infrequent. It, when you go to a global scale, however, those numbers look a lot different. So I found that there are about 2.4 billion Christians on the globe, but there are 1.8 billion Muslims. Aha. Uh -huh. So that's pretty close. Right and then a close third, you've got over a billion people practicing Hinduism. Hindu, yeah. So uh, I remember going to a corporate event and the host was Christian and they were having a group of seven day Adventists come to this event and seven day Adventists don't eat pork. Well, the breakfast buffet, imagine bacon, sausage, <laughs> all these things. Oops. And that's fine, but they probably should have had a turkey sausage or a turkey yeah, bacon. turkey bacon. And the host thought it was hysterical. <laughs> and I'm like, that's not funny. That's not that's funny, not funny. Yeah. I mean, not funny. you know, he really thought it was clever, you know? Mm -hmm. So I think people, individuals, um, because we're just so not used to being around different religions. You know, when people say they have to pray in the middle of the afternoon, I remember somebody was celebrating Ramadan and they said, I need to pray in the afternoon. And all these supervisors were like, well, can we let them do that? <laughs> and all that kind of stuff. So right. you'd be surprised. I think a lot of it is just ignorance. Right, right. Yeah, we have to look really at the tax code. The tax code also benefits Christianity because there are some churches that get, you know, tax benefits. You know, not all churches, I don't think. They're really tax different. exempt. They're yes. tax yeah. exempt. Yeah. Wow. That was a good one, Mark. I didn't think about that one. That is good. Okay. Okay. Here's my. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Do you think men should pay child support <laughs> if they said they did not want to have a child? Uh, 
I'm, I'm gonna start with my guys. I'm gonna start with. I'm gonna start with. I think with you should with start with guys. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so I speak for all men, and I'm gonna say no. Just, <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, I think, I think, uh, I think people that don't have kids that all have to pay child support. Because mm -hmm. I mean, kids are the future. And if I choose not to have kids, it kind of simplifies my life now. But I mean, once I get old, who's gonna pay for me when I'm when I'm old? <laughs> so Marcy, that's the, okay. That's that's interesting. So you would say yes? Absolutely, absolutely. Because I, I mean, I, children's kind of our common. I don't want to say burden, but it's 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 our shared responsibility. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. That man a star. Okay, <laughs> Marcy. Um. So um, over the years, my views on this have changed. Um, I do believe, and there was a path, part, the point in my life where I was that no. However, I now believe, yes, that they should. And part of the reason why I believe that they should is that, um, well, besides the fact that that is their child and they should financially take care of their child, it was not the woman herself who laid down and made that baby. But I believe that... Um, Men and women both need to take accountability for their decisions that they make. And I feel like if you are pay, you are forced to pay child support. Now, first of all, let me start by saying I don't believe anybody should be forced to pay child support if they can make an arrangement with the, the other parent to make sure that the child's needs are taken care of. Here we can see how child support varies based off of the state that you live in. I found this interesting. Like in New Jersey, you're paying $424 a month and you just go and cross the bridge, go into New York, and you're going to pay twice that. However, if they are not doing anything to make sure the child's needs are taken care of, I think they should pay child support. And um, hopefully this is a way for them to take accountability and to not spread so many seeds all over the place. We're being so reckless by not um, either assuming or using protection or being with a person that we actually plan on spending the rest of our life with to create children. Um, so I think hopefully if we make sure that everyone is paying child support, people won't be so reckless out here. Because the women, we have to carry the baby. We have to take care of the children. We have to carry on, even though we don't want to stay burdened because they're children. Let's be honest, we have to take on the full burden of it. So the men should have a role to play. So if your, your pockets are being affected for the next 18 years, maybe you'll think twice before you just recklessly have sex with somebody else that you don't want to have a child with. Interesting, Mark, interesting comment. Um, I think honestly that, and one of the issues I have with courts of like this of this nature is that they tend to do things in a blanket. And so I think it should be case by case, like all things. I don't think you should put a blanket statement on, on every single case. Not every single case is the same. I mean, you're, you're dealing with two humans, um, obviously it takes two people to tango, you know, you got to put two pop tarts in the toaster and all that, but <laughs> I just to sit here and say a yes or no on every single case. To me, that's just, that's just too big of a, of a spectrum. It, to me, it should be much more on a case to case basis. Um, a lot of times in these courts, the men are looked at as, as pieces of crap. As soon as they walk in the door, uh, it's geared against men totally. And I get that because the system was geared against women for so long. Um, but I think in a lot of things in life, we just tend to make blanket statements about things and say, this should cover everything. This should cover everything as to where I think a lot of times they're specialized. Every case is different. Yeah. You, Sandy, you got anything to add to that one? Well, I, I'm a yes. I, I believe that you make a baby together, you know, that child needs to be taken care of. But I have to agree with Mark that I think that child support should be fair um, because like he's saying a case by case, you know, did a woman trick a man? Um, because I know there are cases like that where they deliberately conceived. It wasn't a whoops. Um, you know, was she trying to trap her man? I mean, it, that's, that's tough. But I think pre predominantly I feel you make a child together. I think the, the, the father may not want to be involved in that child's life, but should make sure that child's taken care of. Uh, yeah, but how, how, do you gauge, how do you gauge if a woman has done that? You know, they're probably not going to fess up. 
Well, that's what I tell my son to be so careful. I have a, yeah, you know, yeah. When you have a son that's dating, I'm like, hun, you, you oh, gotta boy. be careful because it's you know you, you may express that you don't want a child, but accidents happen. I mean, they're that's just right. sometimes you can do everything in the world and and accidents yeah. happen. So I said, just make sure this is somebody that you can have a congenial relationship with for the next 18 yeah. years. Because imagine yeah. if it's someone that you can't. I said that would be pretty difficult. Pretty yeah, tough. My kids' child's biggest fault. fear. My kids' biggest fear is like doing that. <laughs> like I don't want to have a child that, with someone I'm not married to and be paying child support. And I'm like, I'm glad that's your biggest <laughs> fear because <laughs> you don't want to be in a way in prison for the next 18 years. Right. In a sense, you know, uh, your money is not your own for at least 18 years. At you know? least 18 so. years. Yeah. The woman and the man, well, the woman, especially well, actually both of them, but yeah, both, yeah, okay. Interesting hmm. is okay. Let's talk about marriage since we talk about children. Uh, marriage rates are declining. I'm gonna give you guys some stats here. It said, uh, the divorce rate in the U.S. is about 50 percent, and that statistic really hasn't changed. And there are a lot of obviously children that have come from divorced parents. Why do you think we see such a high divorce rate? Uh, I think a lot of it is the fact that people just get married just to get married. It's sort of a cultural thing. You know, it's a societal thing. It's part of being ahead. I mean, I can even tell you, I, even just me, I feel better saying my wife rather than my girlfriend. You know, it just sounds better. It feels better. It sounds better, you know, if you are 30 some odd years old and you're not married, people say, well, why? What's wrong with you? Why haven't you found someone that can deal with you? So I think a lot of it's just societal. So they say, I have to get married because that's what I'm supposed to do, you know? And it's more of idea of I don't want to be alone as opposed to I want to spend the rest of my life with this exact person. Wow, Sandy. Mm. Well, I think uh, a lot more couples are just choosing to live together. Um, I, I told you I asked someone these questions earlier in the in the in the day and what the response was on this one. Well, if something happened and you know I wound up single, I would never marry someone again. I would just live together. And I went, really? <laughs> um, so I think I think a lot more people are doing that. Um, I, I looked up a statistic as well, and in, in the uh, a marriage, the average length of a marriage is eight point two years. So if people know that going into marriage, that's kind of a bummer and a downer. So I think it's very important for young people to not make rash decisions. You need to. I don't know how you check it out, but maybe parents involved because I think mom, I'd like Michelle. I think if your son were to bring home a young woman and you went, no, you would. I think you would discern this one could be a problem for you, Anthony. Okay, um, it's tough. It's it's really tough. Um, Eight years. That's the average roof. Eight point really two sad. years. Really wow. I was shocked. What say you, Sergey? I, I guess I think that it's it's a consequences of focus on uh, personal freedoms. So way back when marriage was something practical, that's what you, you basically you marry your kids with some other family, or you know you have to have a lot more kids just to I don't know to work the farm or something. Mm -hmm. But right. now, nowadays, when all these constraints are gone, they, and, and you know it's all about personal freedoms. That's what it is. But I think we have to make a dis distinction between marriage and the kids. So people can live together and that's, that, that, that's fine. But once they have kids, I mean, there are responsibilities. Right. And I guess in our society, we have this kind of, I guess, legal framework that's organized around marriage to support kids, right? Sure. So if we would tweak that legal framework in such that people not married but have kids are still responsible then that would work just fine i think too wow so per, per, per se I, yeah I, I guess i don't see you know being married or not being married i i, I don't know it's it's 
you know, people do what they want to do as long as they're responsible. Right. They... Hey, Marcy, what do you say? So <laughs> I believe um, the reason why the stats went down the way that they did is really because um, what I don't, I want to be careful in saying this because the women's live movement did a lot of great things, um, but also women going to work when the men went to war and all that stuff. Women have jobs and are able to take care of themselves. Um, so things that we put up with in the past because our husbands had to take care of us because we didn't work. We're at home taking care of our kids, taking care of the family. So if our husband cheated on us and we got six kids to take care of, where are we going to go? What are we going to do? We need to be provided for. So we just shut our mouths and we continued on to take care of our families. Now, yeah, exactly. I have a job. I make good money. You cheat on me. You're not, I'm not going to submit up with that. You know, you're going to treat me any kind of way. I'm not going to put up with that. Why? I don't need your money to pay for my bills. I don't need your, you to take care of me. I can take care of myself now. Like, what can I, what can you bring to the table? I bring the table. And so that mentality is why I feel like a lot of marriages are splitting is because the way things were before where we needed that balance, the man worked and he provided, the women took care of the household, they took care of the children. That was a, it was a beautiful balance that um, created families that lasted. You know, now granted, again, I don't condone some of the practices that happened as a result of women almost in a sense being considered property because now things are different. We don't feel like we have to put up with the same things that our grandmothers put up with, you know? And so because of that, we are more readily, we, we will file for a divorce where our grandmothers may, may not have filed for divorce. Another thing about that too is it, back in the days when our grandmothers were around, um, it was unacceptable to have sex outside of marriage. It was unacceptable. And if you did have sex with a woman outside of marriage, especially if she got pregnant, you married her. Yes. Right? That's not the same anymore. Now that people are having right. sex with anyone they want to have sex with. They're having babies all over the place and they're not marrying these women. So you have all these broken households. And so, or or you'll get together and you'll see something that seems better over here because there's social media and you see this, your ex girlfriend from the third grade. So now you want to go and pursue her instead of your household that you have here. And so the man may decide mm, there's something better or the woman may decide mm, there's something better over here. And so I think it's a combination of women working, a combination of social media, a combination of now we don't have the same um, values that we had in, those, in the past to where it made it more conducive for our families. And it's really sad because I do feel like it's almost like an, even though divorce rates have been maintained at about 50% for what past decade, the um, percentage of people marrying is shrinking more and more and more, almost to the point where marriage is seeming to be extinct or becoming think, extinct. Well, I, I think what's interesting is, you know, I just read an article when it talks about men marrying up. It used to be that women, like you said, were in that position where we were financially handcuffed uh, because we didn't work outside the home. We didn't have corporate jobs. And so we didn't have a lot of choices. Now women are starting to feel that sting that, you know, I could go into a courtroom and I could be the one paying a lot of money. Oh, yeah. so, well, it's, that's true. It's so, you know, when you used to laugh and say, well, that's a horrible thing to say. It's cheaper to keep her. I hear a lot of my friends saying, you know what? Oh, yeah. Before I give away half of my assets, it, it's just a different thing. And then also, you know, because I have a daughter, I found this other stat, which I think was kind of alarming that only 30% of African-Americans were married as opposed to 48% of all Americans. And that 50% of African-Americans have never been married, have never married and as compared to 34% of all Americans. And in fact, African-American women they're saying are having the highest divorce rates because of a limited number of acceptable mates. And so instead of us waiting or thinking we can date outside our race because we've been reluctant to do that, we mm -hmm. pick wrong, <laughs> we pick very wrong, and then we end up having the highest divorce rate. So sisters, I guess I'm saying to you, if you find a good man, uh, I wouldn't be looking for some of those superficial things. Yes. You know, I think you gotta stop looking at race. You gotta start saying, yep. you know, if he's a garbage man, I'm not gonna marry him. If he's a decent man, yeah, he, he comes <laughs> home every night and you don't have to go looking for him. Preach. I think you <laughs> start making different choices. 
There's well, another statistic. Interesting interesting yeah. answers. I have seen another statistic. I want to say last week. I don't, I feel like it was, I don't know if it was after this or before um, I had knew about this, but I was looking at the statistics of uh, marriage years ago, like back when our my grandmother's alive. And actually they said it was a higher percentage of black women marrying to white women marrying. And part of it is we need our black couples to white. We needed one another. Yep. But now it's like, we almost feel like we don't need one that, and we're, we're, oh, let's bring up another thing. <laughs> the Kevin Samuels era, era and all this stuff like that, that's causing so much division and strife between women and men, you know? And it's like, where we needed one another, it's like, it's like women are like, well, I want a high value man. If he's not high value, I can't be with him, even if I'm already married to him. And men have to have the certain standards. So there's so much combativeness between um, coupled as African Americans, which is really, really sad and really hurting us um, as families as well. Well, so. and I think you're going to see more prenups too. I think you're oh, going to yeah. see more oh, yeah. middle class people doing prenups. Say, you know what? <laughs> you know, I we may have built this together, or we may not have built this together. But I think at some point we had to be adult enough to say uh, some of these billion dollar divorces. You know, it, it's getting a little bit ridiculous. Yeah, for sure. And yeah. like I said, even though someone also mentioned, it's the courtship. I, I talk to my wife about this all the time. You know, we, when you have a wedding and you ask for a gift, even that has changed. You know, back in the day, you have wedding and you got like coffee makers and you got all these things. And it's like now I've lived with my wife years before we got married. I don't need a coffee maker. I, right. <laughs> you know, right. I don't need all these. I don't need a dine bar set. I have all these things because we've lived together for five, six, seven, eight years. That's where back in the day you would court someone. And then you would start your life together and you would move in and buy all these things. And it's like, you know, just even simple things like that. You know, I have everything I need, you know, I, give me some money for my for my uh, honeymoon. You know what I mean? That's what I want. In my yeah. I just think that uh, with, with a lot less financial constraints and a lot more freedoms, I think yeah. we're looking at the brave new world coming. Well, yeah. I think our kids now, they just want to know they're, they're in a relationship yeah. where there's freedom that you're not there because of some obligation and I, and I think when a couple does get married now if they've had a good relationship before that they're like we're past the point of being obligated we really want to be together we just really want to be together it's not because it's a shotgun wedding it's not because you know uh, all these other things that used to propel people into marriages that they weren't ready for so uh, but I feel like even that as noble as that sounds, I feel like this off of that butterflies in the stomach. I just really want to be with that person, I, you know, lovey-dovey feelings. But when things get real, they don't have that sense of obligation. And so that's another reason why people split up. Since it was a business arrangement, we had a family to take care of. We have a dynasty to take care of. And it's just not that same. It's like when those butterflies and I just want to be with this person goes away, the person gains weight, this, that, and the other. It's like all of a sudden they don't feel that sense of obligation that, that our grandparents had. Well, you actually are seeing that kind of language in prenups now about weight gain and oh, yeah. <laughs> and so like, oh. oh boy, would I be in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> Oh man, where we all? <laughs> okay, we gotta. Uh, Isn't that a benefit of getting married? You can let yourself go. <laughs> well, no. yeah, then you wake up and like, who is that? Uh, right. Oh my goodness! <laughs> then there comes divorce. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I want to thank Annette White. Uh, she actually has a website that I actually found some of these. Um, questions and she talks about your bucket list journey so if these questions were appealing to you please go to net white's site uh, there's some more interesting questions that i think if you're having any discussion groups at your house and you really want to be able to get into some topics to really get people's uh, blood flowing uh check out her blog and annette shout out to you and thanks for allowing us to use your questions thanks for tuning into tab talks good night Tune in next week when we finish answering our questions.